and uh, you and I share a love for the Kansas City Royals and got an opportunity to be the assistant director of marketing for the Kansas City Royals. Um, Rush Limbaugh was my boss for a year until he got let go for one, standing around the water cooler talking all the time, um, especially about politics. <laughs> and um, uh, after uh, I may have told you before that uh, it was my idea for the Royals to win the 1985 World Series. Hey, welcome to Simple Faith. We're glad you're with us. Hope you've subscribed to us on the YouTube channel. You can watch us there. And for those of you listening in your car while you're working out or cooking dinner or whatever, we're glad you're with us as well. Today we got a guy you've probably not heard of before, but years ago he decided, what if I started an organization that helped out athletes in schools and created an opportunity for us to share our faith? That's exactly what he did. And Scott Peterson is a guy that maybe you've not heard of, but you won't soon forget. And for everybody out there that's trying to figure out, how do I take my faith into my workplace? How do I impact the people in my world? This is going to be incredibly encouraging for you. So I want to make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can take a look at us and see what we're wearing. Uh, But more seriously, so you can see our guest and uh, hear from him directly. And maybe YouTube is your preferred medium to access his content. You can also uh, grab information from... uh, Uh, Spotify and uh, iHeartRadio as far as how to get more information on this and share this with a friend. But I want to encourage you to also subscribe. It would be fantastic. So here's my conversation with Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson, thank you so much for joining the show. For our audience who may not know who you are, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, I'm not the Scott Peterson who's probably more famous <laughs> and I'm in jail out in California. So, Rusty, if you thought if people thought you had him on the show, that was a pretty big get for you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't want people to Google him right now. So, go no. ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, yeah. No, I'm uh, uh, very happy to be here and excited to to uh, spend some time. I. Um, have a long sports career. Okay. The best way to describe it. And if I tried to describe everything about it, uh, I would take much of your podcast, but suffice to say, I have experienced literally everything you can possibly experience in sports. I've been blessed so much. For almost half a century, GNPI has been creating media and sharing Jesus from solar kits to social media. The gospel message has been on the move around the world because of people like you, The ministry is now 27 teams strong in 16 countries. And with the inauguration of Nomad Academy, a new generation of media makers receive training to create media and share the good news. In India, Hindi Church Online reaches hundreds of thousands of viewers per week. Projects like the Global Gospel and Amazing Stories connect with children and adults alike in their own heart languages. In fact, GNPI teams engaged over 66 million with the good news last year. But with billions still waiting, we must do more. So, where do we go from here? Mission 15. This movement will send 1 billion gospel invitations by the end of 2030. It's going to take all of us to reach this goal. What can you do? It's easy. Simply pray, share, and give. You can pray for 15 minutes that people around the world will hear the good news. You can share your faith 15 times with others. Invite them to your small group or church. You can give $15 one time or monthly. With every $15 given, 450 gospel invitations will go out. Just imagine the impact you could have over a year when you pray, share, and give. By the power of the Holy Spirit and your partnership, We at GNPI believe this audacious goal is attainable to send 1 billion invitations to follow Jesus by the end of 2030. Will you join the movement? Bless so much. Um, My first job out of school, I went to Nebraska uh, where the N on the helmet stands for knowledge. And I uh, (laughs) moved down to Oklahoma State University, where I was the recruiting coordinator for really all of sports at Oklahoma State. So uh, not only football, who Jimmy Johnson was our football coach at Oklahoma State at that time, and many of the people who followed him around to Miami and Dallas. One thing right now, how about them Cowboys? Uh, I did not take that track with them, but I recruited uh, Bill Self, the coach at uh, Kansas, the basketball coach now at Kansas, Uh, recruited Garth Brooks to throw the javelin, 
Uh, so I had kind of a fun time growing that way. <laughs> when uh, Jimmy and his uh, group went to Miami, I decided this. I was a country boy from Nebraska, so I uh, and loved baseball. And uh, you and I share a love for the Kansas City Royals, and I got an opportunity to be the assistant director of marketing for the Kansas City Royals. Um, Rush Limbaugh was my boss for a year until he got let go for water, standing around a water cooler talking all the time, um, especially about politics. <laughs> and um, uh, after uh, I may have told you before that uh, it was my idea for the Royals to win the 1985 World Series. Um, and then I moved down to Atlanta uh, in about 1986, got my World Series ring. Mm. Um, and then I traveled around doing work for an agency that did had relationships with the NFL and the Major League Baseball and uh, the NBA and NASCAR, uh, literally every bucket list thing you could do in sports, wow. I had an opportunity to do. And um, then started my own sports agency at the NFL's request, said, hey, we're going to funnel you clients and you just kind of build out what you'd like to build out uh, because you're doing stuff that we have never done before. And uh, just build a life in terms of like rep everything from representing athletes uh, not so much from their contract standpoint, but from their endorsements uh, standpoint. Oh, we do. We did have some um, athletes that we represented. Um, was involved with the, uh, I don't know if you remember the Lance Armstrong's Live Strong program with the yellow wristband. But of course, uh, my company did the marketing and PR around uh, that program that uh, 100 million wristbands um, later, it was it was one of the most uh, sought after cause related programs that's ever been done. Mm. And then um, and so now I uh, a few years ago and I'll get into this a little as we go along. But um, God kind of started making it uh, had me some had something he wanted me to do. And uh, unlike and like a lot of characters in the Bible, I kind of fought it. You know, because here I am, I'm doing everything I ever want to do, making good money, and God wants me to do something that's different. And um, and even though I kind of gave him the stiff arm uh, for a while, he made it so miserable for me to be where I was that I ended up going and doing it. And as miserable as I thought it might be, it was worse. And then it is flourished into something that, that uh, he had intended all along. Yeah, I'd love to ask you about that, because I think a lot of our listeners have been there where they've been in a, <clears throat> as you describe, a cushy existence where things are kind of moving along. Mm -hmm. But there's something inside them thinking, boy, I think God has something else for me. And then God begins to make their cushy existence a little bit difficult to move them into something else. Is that what you experienced? Yeah. And, I, you know, I always prayed for him to say, hey, I want to be used. I want you to utilize me. But you always kind of want him to utilize you in the way you want him to utilize mm, you. Right. And that's kind of what I thought he was going to do, as opposed to something that was completely outside of that. Not not outside sports, because he had given me all of these connections in sports. He was going to say, hey, look, guy, I gave you all of these great sports connections. Now I want you to do something with them. And. I didn't really have a whole plan as to what to do. And that's the scary part, right? I, I think that in terms of people like Abraham, you know, when, when God said, I want you to do, you know, do this, you're like for 10 years, he, he was kind of waiting around going, okay, you said you got something you want me to do. I was kind of afraid to say, what are the next 10 years going to look like? And am I going to be able to handle that? Because I've been in such a high paced industry and doing all of these things, I'm, I want to go. I want to make it happen right now. And patience was not something that uh, I was overly um, excelling at at that point in my life. <laughs> well, so he leads you into this uh, incredible industry and nonprofit and um, a ministry, for lack of a better term. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, positive athletes and what that looks like. Yeah. So one of the things that I worked on with the NFL was pe many people are uh, remember or know about the Walter Payton Man of the Year. Mm -hmm. And it's an award not for performance on the field. It's performance in the community. It's things people have overcome. And so I kind of wanted to take that idea and do it at the high school level mm -hmm. because there are 20, uh, I think it's about 12 and a half million kids playing high school sports. And about 1% of them are ever going to go on and be elite athletes and play at the professional level. It may even be less than that. And 
what we wanted to do was reward kids for not for what they do on their teams and the, the performance related stuff. It's who are you in your community? Or what kind of mission trips are you taking? What kind of things have you done for other people? What kind of difficult circumstances have you been through that uh, that we should, that other people could be inspired about? Hmm. And so what we did was we created these positive athlete awards in high school where we rena- renamed about 30 kids, the most positive athlete in ten- boys tennis, girls tennis, um, boys basketball, girls basketball. And, and um, I actually started this with a guy named Heinz Ward, who I don't, I don't oh, yeah. know if the listeners know of, but, but Heinz was a Super Bowl MVP and, and uh, one Dancing with the Stars and all of those, all two things I've never done. Um, <laughs> and uh, I asked Heinz, I said, what kind of a legacy do you want to leave? Because up in Pittsburgh, the Steeler, you know, fans are used to all of these guys. I say heads on plaques. You know, a lot of guys in the Hall of Fame. And Heinz was going to probably be there, too. But what is your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? And he said, look, Scott, I, I trust that you will create something that will be really interesting. And so the whole idea was they got to come to downtown Pittsburgh. And Heinz Ward would give away the more, the most positive football player, girls basketball player. And at that time, Heinz was like at the height of his popularity in, in Pittsburgh. And so built that, started inviting companies to come along. Hey, you want to stand next to Heinz Ward and give it away award for positivity? And had very few t- you know people who didn't want to do that. Uh-huh. And then he lived in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta. And, he, and we said, let's do this in Atlanta and Georgia. And to give you an update, uh, last year, we had over 400 high schools, gave us over 6,800 nominations of kids. Wow. And and in this time period, we've given over a half million dollars in scholarships to kids, not for what a great athlete they were or they were, but what a great person they were. And we're trying to encourage that. How do you determine out of 6,800 applicants, which one wins? Well, that's a really good question. You know, positivity is very subjective. Right. And and uh, so what we do is when nominations come in, we kind of give them an A, B, C, D grading. And we, we've learned to read them pretty quickly to say, OK, that's a story that you might want to watch on the news, you know, and, okay. and that's an A. And then, this, then the D's are like, hey, this kid's a really positive athlete. <laughs> There's not much to that, but you know <laughs> that the kid is a good kid. So we take kind of all our A's and B's and kind of utilize them and start with them and figure out, all right, what are the stories we want to tell? What are you know, because. You could tell the kid the story of the kid who has cancer each time, and then you'd say, oh, you guys are positive athletes with cancer. It's like, no, we're positive athletes who kid, whose kids' dads are incarcerated, you know, kid, positive athlete for a kid who has um, born with one hand and is playing baseball, and all of those kinds of things that the stories we want to tell. And, Rusty, the thing that we, we always say is we want to create the new ROI, you know, in business, we're always used to the return on investment. But what we want is the return on inspiration. Mm. And, and because we feel if you tell these stories to kids, you're going to meet them at a point in which they're saying, you know what, I've been through that or my dad just got incarcerated. What am I supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Um, we had a young lady in Macon, Georgia, who was a softball player. And like most kids that are playing sports these days, they're on travel teams and all they do is play softball, 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 softball. And she was like, what do I ever do to help somebody? And um, so we we found out her story was that she said, you know what? I'm going to take my sport. I'm a pitcher. For everybody I strike out, I want people to give me some money um, toward the Macon Food Bank. Uh, this girl raises $30,000 for the Macon Food Bank in, in just getting all doing all of the work to get people to donate for every strikeout she does. Well, the return on inspiration there is we've had we've shared that story and kids all over are, are saying, well, I'm a tennis player. I could do that. I'm a wrestler. I could do that. And so we don't know. I'm not, on this side of heaven. I'm not going to find out exactly how much money was was raised on those things that that were just inspired by other kids that we found. Did you know that there's more than six billion people who do not know Jesus, don't have a relationship with him. Three billion that don't even know his name, haven't even heard of him. Good News Productions International is working to solve that problem. GNPI has been working for decades now to help use media 
to help people come to know and find and follow Jesus. You can check out more from gnpi.org, but you can also go and be a part of their bold initiative to share the gospel over 1 billion times in the next few years. Check out mission15.global or go to gnpi.org. I'm going to ask you to sign up through mission15.global and pledge 15 bucks a month. That's like a latte or two in order to help people come to know Jesus globally. The work they do is incredible, and you're going to want to hear all about it on our podcast with Mike Schrage. So check that out and check out GNPI and the work they're doing, mission15.global, and be a part of it today. So I can't imagine early on in your career, right out of college, you were thinking, boy, this is what I'm going to end up doing with my life. So yeah. give me kind of the, uh, the trajectory of your, maybe your faith, but also even how that intersected with your career to where I'm sure at one point in your life, it was about, you know, success, achieving goals, making money. And somehow God began to shift that a little bit. Did that happen before you started Positive Athletes? Or was that, you know, just kind of coinciding at the same time? Or was God doing a work in you long ago? You can look back and see, boy, this was this was all leading to this moment. Right. I, yeah, I, I say we're all in a New Testament part, uh, book of our own lives. Right? And mm. mine kind of started out with really no faith-based, uh, you know, grew up in Nebraska, my family believed that there was a God and believed that there was a man named Jesus. And we went to church and those things. But I didn't have a personal relationship of any sort. I really didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord until I met my wife in my late 20s. And and so really, she was the one that kind of created this opportunity for me to start really thinking about it. And, uh, you know, so I, I can't sit there and say, hey, from the moment I was born, I was a Christian. And, mm -hmm. and it, like my, my son, uh, my kids are all, you know, have known the Lord since the, they came out of the womb. So um, but for me, it was harder because I experienced all these cool things, mm -hmm. you know, and it was you have this lifestyle that you're just loving and, and doing all these things. And I didn't give much of a, a thought about a relationship with the Lord. And um, and I think what happened was once I started going to church and I was I guess it was kind of a, a, of the belief that a lot of people are. And that was, how is God ever going to forgive me for these first 27, 28 years? Like <laughs> he didn't even care about me. And oh, now you want to jump on my bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And 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 so and even things I did just having just being a single guy, just flying all over the country and just enjoying life and doing everything you wanted to do. And it was like, yeah, but you don't know what I've done in that time period. It's like, mm. what am I, how am I supposed to be? And I think that's probably more than anything, Rusty, where it took off for me. Now, even in that time period, when you're having success and you may have been introduced to the Lord and he, okay, I'm, on, I'm, I'm forgiven. I get that now. But some of the things in your life, you don't change. You know, you kind of still are kind of going after this, like, OK, I'm still trying to do this. This is success is what's going to be the thing that people are going to remember about Scott Peterson. It's 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 that kind of like still was in me. And I think what God did was I think God said, all right, dude, you've had your fun and and I'm going to have let you have more fun. But you're not going to think it's that much fun when we get this thing started. Um so I, that's why I fought it. That's why I said I kind of fought doing that because it was like, well, no, I got I think I know a little more about sports marketing than you do. And, uh, you know, and every time I try to take the wheel away from him, I drive it into the ditch uh, and he has to pull me out again. <laughs> but I but I I think that I learned over over time and I'm still learning. I mean, I just turned 65 this year, Rusty, mm -hmm. and I'm still learning what God can do. I'm still learning patience and trust. And I think what he wanted me to do was this period, it wasn't easy. The last 10 years have been tough. It was a grind. It was a grind on us financially. It was a grind on my uh, connections in sports because I was like, I, I started feeling less relevant, less relevant, less relevant. And where I could call anybody around the sports league, but I didn't have anything to call them about. You know? Right. And so I struggled with that. And uh, God has been slowly but surely saying, look, I need you to get to that point 
where you totally surrender to me and let me take the wheel. Mm. And he goes, I know you know a lot about sports. I know you lie a lot about this whole thing, but I have a plan and I need you to let me run it. And until I came to that conclusion, Rusty, it was it was hard work. And ever since I came to the conclusion, it's been like, just let him go. <laughs> and it's amazing what he'll do. Wow. So this um, newfound trust that you've developed, I've noticed that when you're living it, it's easy to pick out people that you say, oh man, you were one decision away from discovering what's on the other side of that, of saying yes to Jesus, of finally fully trusting. It's one thing to make him our, our savior. It's another thing to make him our Lord, right? Mm -hmm. When you see, let's say, positive athletes, and they're good kids, but you think, boy, if you decided to follow Jesus, this would be exponential. Or you see business leaders and you think, Boy, if you decided to make Jesus the Lord of your business rather than just your savior for your sins, it would be exponential. What advice would you give them? What, you know, talk to the old you. What would you say to some of these individuals who are just on the cusp of moving from just positive to being uh, exponential in the kingdom of God? Well, that every decision you make is important. And I have made some choices on things, or I wanted some things to happen that didn't end up happening. I was very upset with God about. And I look back two years afterward and I go, oh man, I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> if that had happened, it would have been a disaster. <laughs> and, and maybe it's just sometimes you have to kind of go through those things to understand that God, if you let God be in control the whole time, he will send you down the right path and he will get you where he wants you. It's not where I want to be. It's where he wants me to be. And I think that that's the thing I've had to learn mm. is to say any, anytime I have a setback, anytime something doesn't happen that I want to have happen, I have to trust that God had a reason for that to happen mm. or not happen. And the more I've gotten into that, the more, I have recognized it as I kind of go through that valley and come back up on top. And I'm, and that's where I get the, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I didn't do that. That would have, that would have killed things. And, um, and I think that that's what God, that's where God wants you to be. And so I think you, when you put too much trust in your own self and your own abilities versus trusting totally that God is the one in charge, that's a hard thing to do. And it's very, it's not easy. And it takes a lot of faith, but you have to believe, let him be in charge, let him take it over. And he will. But we, we just want to hold on to things so tightly, especially when you think you're you know, a hot shot in the sports marketing world. Right. And then he shows you, yeah, no, you're not. I could, I can actually do bigger things than you, you can even imagine. <laughs> Some of our listeners might be thinking of starting a nonprofit. They're, they're in their field of industry. They love it, but they think, boy, there's a way I could give back. I could do something that could impact people. What would you caution them about or you know, maybe even some of the lessons you learned along the way to help them in that venture? Well, I think the one thing, one smart thing I was able to do at the start was I did not start Positive Athlete as a nonprofit. Okay. And I think a lot of people feel like they have to start a nonprofit so that they can do nonprofit related things. Okay. Hmm. That you can start businesses that have a, have a kingdom building, um, outcome hopefully, and, and be able to handle it that way versus necessarily having to start a nonprofit right away. Mm -hmm. Cause all of us in our businesses should be, uh, should be doing something for the Lord and doing something. And this is, this is what positive athlete, that was my heart was to give back. I want to do things that will help kids that will help um, schools change the whole culture around schools. So I did not start Positive Athlete as a nonprofit. A nonprofit was developed alongside of it gotcha. so that we could handle the scholarships and people who wanted to do particular things. But I would just say before you just say, I'm just going to go do a nonprofit, think about maybe what you might be able to do as a business. Mm. And even if your business is you know, sometimes it's hard to, I don't know everybody's situation. I just knew in mine is that, okay, this, this can become a nonprofit. I can create a nonprofit entity out of it, but don't just give in to saying it has to be a nonprofit. That's great. 
Well, for our listeners who want to know more, can you give us the website of where they can find out about this? Yeah, you can absolutely. Uh, we have uh, a website, positiveathlete.org. Uh, very simply, just and it's just athlete, not athletes, but positiveathlete.org. And uh, if you if you want to get connected to me on that, I'd be happy to I talk to anybody um, and uh, would have to be happy to hear anybody's story or ideas. And we're uh, right now in the process of potentially taking Positive Athlete nationally. Hmm. And we have some investors who are very interested in putting us in Dallas and putting us in, in Los Angeles and places like that. One of the things we've done, Rusty, and, uh, is we created an app. What we found was all of these schools would like to do character education programs, but the problem with it is they buy the kids books. And I don't know if you've talked to many high school kids lately, they don't like to read books. <laughs> they like this thing, this phone that uh, is where they live. And so what we did is we created a library of 250 to 300, one to, one to three minute segments of their modern day heroes talking about courage, talking about uh, encouragement, um, talking about uh, the cost of leadership, all of these different things that are very biblically based. Mm. But it's LeBron James talking about it, and it's and it's Steph Curry talking about it, and it's you know it's Nick Saban talking about it. And what we found was kids will listen to that. Kids, kids, if you send it to their phone where they live, they will get those kind of things. And we already have ten thousand kids on the app right now. Wow! And we hope to, we hope to gain traction on that and have it in. As many of those 12.5 million kids playing sports, we'd love to have that uh, character building app in their, on their phones. Mm, that's a really good idea. I can't wait to check that out. Okay, well, for our wrap-up, I want to ask you just a few random questions about your past and your life when it comes to uh, sports. So the first one is this. You went to the Braves organization when they were just becoming really good. They went to a string of several World Series. They had a great pitching rotation. There was a culture involved there. What was unique about working for the Braves that maybe you didn't see in other organizations? Well, I didn't actually work for the Braves, but I was very involved with them in terms of John Sherholz, who was our general manager at the Kansas City Royals. Mm -hmm. He moved to the Atlanta Braves, and the first thing he did was he called me and because he knew I lived down here. And, and so the culture change just had to be this, we're losers. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, this is just kind of who we are. We kind of accept that. And, and, uh, and John wasn't having any of it. And, um, and I took a lot of people have to kind of start preparing for success. And they, cause they looked at us at the Royals and they said, well, those guys, yeah, they have success all the time. And, and the Braves were not having success. I said, well, you have to build it. So as if the team all of a sudden gets good, are you prepared for the massive amount of people who are going to want to come to the games? And, um, and so that was the culture you had to change was just this, you know, well, this is kind of who we are and we'll always kind of finish fifth or sixth in the division. And it's like, you have to change that attitude. You have to have an optimistic attitude. Mm, that's good. Okay. So you've met a lot of athletes over your time. What was an athlete that you met that you were a little bit in awe of made you a little nervous because either you were, uh, enamored with their accomplishments, their character, or perhaps they were a personal childhood hero of yours? Uh, well, I would have to say Johnny Rogers, who was a Heisman Trophy winner at Nebraska. When I grew up, he was like, he was everybody's favorite. And I was like, okay, I'll never meet Johnny Rogers in my life. And then I actually met him. And it was the first time, because I've met literally everybody you can think of. I've met Peyton Manning. I've met all of the, you know, and, and Johnny Rogers, it's funny. He was the one though, that I kind of like started getting a little tongue tied and uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to say to him. Um, <laughs> but I've been around a lot of them now. And so I think once you get into that industry, I've never been an autograph seeker. I've never been like a picture, get to get a selfie with somebody. I wish I had, cause I have a great, but the one, there one somebody was, somebody was outside sports that I actually met who was probably the one that I was a little intimidated by. And that was Coretta Scott King. Hmm. And I had come up with an idea to do the dream bowl, which was a college all-star football game on the Martin Luther King holiday. Hmm. And so Andrew Young, who was right alongside Dr. King, uh, I had a meeting lunch meeting with him. He introduced me to Mrs. King 
And Mrs. King said, yeah, come on over to my house. I want to talk about it. So I went to her house and I'm sitting in the living room of Martin Luther King's, when the house he lived in when he was assassinated, because Mrs. King hadn't lived out of there. And I'm sitting there, what is Scott Peters from Nebraska doing in Carolina? Trying not to knock over a Nobel Peace Prize or something. And, <laughs> and I'm, it, that is, is a very surreal moment. Oh, wow. That's hard to wrap my mind around. Uh, okay, last one. How good was uh, Garth Brooks at throwing the javelin? Um, not great. <laughs> but you have to remember that at the time it was that he went there. It was the Big Eight Conference. That's right. Um, yeah. It's now Big Twelve. Back then there was eight. There were seven javelin throwers. So when I went and talked to our coach, our track coach, I said, "Well, what do you need?" He goes, "You got a guy that can throw a javelin from here to that wall?" And I said. <laughs> Well, let me go check it out. I met, I found this kid uh, who had, uh, you know, thrown the javelin in high school a couple of times and said, well, if you want to come to Oklahoma State, you know, he was already coming to Oklahoma State. He's like, well, you know, do you want to do that? And he's, well, I hope it doesn't interrupt my music career. And I was like, well, buddy, you know, I hope, you know, we'll, we'll keep out of your way, not knowing it was Garth Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Uh, you got to work with Rush Limbaugh. Was there ever a moment you thought, this guy really should be on the radio? Um, no, not really. I, we went to lunch every day. I had to go to lunch with him every day because I was his assistant and no one else would go to lunch with Rush. Um, and so all <laughs> Rush wanted to do was talk politics. And I'm like, hey, Rush, we, shouldn't we talk about sponsorships and things like that? And, <laughs> and then when, after Rush was let go, he went to KCMO Radio in Kansas City and was really doing what Rush did the rest of his career, but it wasn't flying in Kansas City. So in Sacramento, the, the Kansas City Kings moved from Kansas City out to Sacramento, and their PR director called me and said, hey, you got anybody in Kansas City knows anything about the Kings or professional basketball. So I called Rush and said, Hey Rush, you know, are you interested in maybe being a color man for the Cantor, the Sacramento Kings? He goes, what would I even send him? I said, well, send that stuff you were doing in the afternoon that nobody liked. <laughs> he, sent it, he sent it out there and like, they loved it. And that's how he got his, so I always told Rush and up to the point when he passed, he was like, man, dude, you'd be nothing without me. <laughs> That's so great. Well, it's hard to imagine that somebody that conservative didn't really fly in Kansas City. I thought that would go well, but apparently not. It wasn't so much it wasn't so much his conservative thoughts. It was really they weren't used to that kind of a big personality speaking so boldly about stuff. Mm -hmm. And but that was Rush. I mean, that, it, he was that way his entire life. It wasn't a persona. He was just that was who he was. And uh, and I think that probably bothered people more in Kansas City than just the vibrato of like, you know, I, I'm blessed by God to do this, you know, mm -hmm. and I think everybody kind of was thrown off a little bit back back in 1985. Yeah. Coming to you with half my brain tied behind my back. Yeah. Exactly. They weren't ready for that in the Midwest. <laughs> OK, I could see that. Well, Scott, this has been fantastic. All the best to you and Positive Athlete. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And for thank you, I just want to thank you for making the uh, 85 Royals a uh, uh, world champion team because that was your marketing plan. So thank you, buddy. Well, you're very welcome. And yeah, I don't think the Kansas City fans know that, but, uh, <laughs> but I appreciate you at least acknowledging it. Now, it's been fun. Thank you for having me. I'd love to, love to come back whenever you want me. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Frankly, I don't know how many senior pastors are listening to your podcast, Rusty, but I, hopefully when they hear what I'm about to say, this will help them celebrate and challenge them to engage this conversation with their lay leadership teams. But uh, it's not uncommon for us to find that one of the key reasons why churches are stuck is because senior pastors aren't empowered to do what God called them to do. Well, thank you, Scott. And I'll never forget... The N on the Nebraska helmet stands for knowledge. Just fantastic. Hey, great stuff from him. Hope you share this with a friend. Check us out on YouTube. If you're watching YouTube right now, then you get to see I actually have a Nebraska helmet here in front of me, which I took a vow never to actually be in the presence of one or put my hand on one, but now I'm casting out demons from it. Hey, uh, we're so glad that you have chosen to listen to this. Share it with a friend. Subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. 
Send us some stuff to fill up the table, a coffee mug, um, a favorite piece of memorabilia, preferably sports. We're not accepting anything from the Celtics or let's see, who else do we not enjoy? Uh, Nebraska Cornhuskers. Frazier heading more numbers. Um, the Philadelphia Phillies or New York Yankees, just not going to do it. I can't. I just get, uh, ac no, and actually the Duke Blue Devils as well. Don't send it that way. Hey, listen, you can send that to Crossroads Christian Church, which is 6450 on State Highway 360. A lot of numbers there, but it'll work. Also open your high school locker. And that's in Grand Prairie, Texas. Send it our way, Crossroads Christian Church. The care of Rusty George. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on Simple Faith.